All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another class with myself. My name is Dennis. The professor. Since I've been away, I've had the opportunity to try to improve the lighting over here, make it a little better, so give me some feedback on that. Today we'll be looking at money and banking. And in particular, within money and banking, which is the study of financial institutions and the flow of money, um, we'll be looking at the behavior of interest rates. Now, first and foremost, it's important to recognize the following. Right? We study money and banking so that we can be better informed financial citizens. Right? If we're not well informed financial citizens, we're going to fall prey to all kinds of scams, bad deals, and so on and so forth, and we'll never get to take advantage of the leverage that finance offers small business owners, individuals, and so on and so forth to accelerate their lives and their base of success. Right? And the reason we're looking in particular at the behavior of interest rates today is because the behavior of interest rates is going to affect just about everything you do. Whether you're lending money, borrowing money to get a house, um, even if you're starting a new job, sometimes your salary will be pegged to the rate of inflation, right? Which in turn affects the rate of interest that's pre prevailing in the economy, right? So that's what you're gonna wanna look at is you're gonna wanna look at the behavior of interest rates, right? And that's what we're gonna learn today, right? So there's a lot of factors, there's a lot of factors that influence interest rates. Factors of interest rates. Now in particular, right, um, we're going to talk about the supply and demand for debt or credit. Supply and demand, oh, I wrote demand again. Um, hmm. Oh, just to make sure I have my paper towel. Supply and demand for debt. Now, why is the supply, supply and demand for debt important? Now, let's imagine that everyone suddenly decides that they want to buy a home, right? A lot of those people will have to borrow money to buy a home. Now, if more and more people are showing up, and the amount of money is staying the same, we're going to be charging people more and more interest for what they're borrowing, right? The same goes for corporate debt, right? So all of those things are there. So what, what increases demand for an asset? Right? Try to think about this and kind of write down a few things and, and I'll cover them as the class goes on, right? So the first thing that increases demand for an asset So let's see, demand for assets. The first thing is going to be wealth. This is almost a no-brainer. As you become more wealthy, you buy more things, right? Obviously, this has a certain level. If you have trillions of dollars, you're probably not buying trillions times more things than someone with a couple dollars. But the reality is for the majority of people, as they become more wealthy, they demand more assets, right? The next thing is expected return. And with expected return, if I was to tell you that you could take your money and put it into a bank, for example, right? And in exchange, the bank, if you put the money in today, in exchange, the bank would give you $2 tomorrow. You'd rush to put as many dollars into the bank as possible. Now, if I told you that the opposite were true, that if you put a dollar in today, the bank might give you a penny in a year, you'd probably keep more of your assets out of the bank and out of investments. So the expected return is going to affect how much assets people demand, right? The next thing is risk. And risk is going to be a subject that we spend quite a bit of time on because risk is so important to financial instruments. But with risk, the idea is as there's more risk in something that you do, you're less likely to buy it. So for example, taking it back to that bank, if there was a 10% chance that you'd get a dollar or a 90% chance that you'd lose your money, 
you probably wouldn't take that investment, right, at all. Now, if it was flipped around and there was a 90% chance that you'd double it or a dollar that you'd lose it, you'd be more likely to take it, right? So risk is a determining factor. And as risk rises, the demand for assets actually declines. And then finally, liquidity. And this is pretty important, right? When you put your money into a bank, you can get it out very easily, right? You put your money into a bank, you're not too worried about, is the bank gonna be open or am I gonna be able to get to an ATM, right? Those are really your preventing factors. Am I gonna find my debit card, right? Not a big deal. However, if you put your money into a house, you have to be able to sell that house. So that house is very illiquid, right? In terms of you can't just break off a window or break off a door and bring it to the store and trade it for cheeseburgers, right? You need to sell the entire house which means you need to find a buyer, you need to pay all the applicable fees, and the house price will fluctuate, right? So it's an illiquid asset. So as assets become more liquid, right? For example, imagine if you could take your house and just trade it for some cheeseburgers and still have most of the house left, right? Then you would do it much more often. People would be much more likely to buy houses because the asset is liquid now. So those are the, those are the factors affecting the demand for assets. Right? And as these factors will evaluate how that changes the demand for different assets. And, and you know, in this case, debt or credit, right? when you have credit, what you're doing is you're selling your money. Right? So if you're buying someone else's debt, that means you're selling money in capital markets. Right? That's why they refer to as capital markets because it's where you sell your excess money. Right? So buying someone else's debt is a demand for an asset. Right? Because you're going to be getting some interest and so on and so forth and you're going to record it on your books as having an asset. Right? Because someone else owes you that money and that money will come in. So what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at the supply and demand curves in the bond market. So the bond market is a particularly clear illustration of this because the factors are easy to control, right? Easy to control and they're actually extremely important, right? So what we'll see is we'll see various interest rates ranging from 0% all the way to 33%. Right? And remember, these interest rates correspond to price. So at 0%, a bond costs $1,000. You pay $1,000, you get back $1,000. At 33%, a bond costs $750. That's what you put in, and you get 1000 back. And then we'll look at the quantity that's supplied and demanded. Right. So this would be our supply curve. And this is our demand curve. So let's spend a minute just talking about this and trying to understand why this is the case. Right? So at $750, and this is in you know billions or hundreds of thousands or whatever you want to imagine, but the, the point is they're placeholders for quantity, right? 100, 200, 300, 400, and 500. Right? So at 33% interest, you're going to be very interested in buying a bond, right? Your demand for the bond is going to be very high. Oh, excuse me. At 33% interest, the demand for the bond is going to be very high, right? So this is where it falls. There's going to be a demand for $500 billion worth of bonds. However, at that same interest rate, most companies don't have projects that they can finance that are worth that much. So their supply of bonds is going to be very low, right? This is our supply curve. So on the supply side, it's going to be very low. And so the tendency will be if the supply is low and the demand is very high, people are going to be willing to pay more money or receive less interest for the bonds that are available. And what that does is it moves the supply of bonds over and it moves the demand for bonds over, right? So essentially, you always have this situation where you're moving towards equilibrium. Give me just one second. Let me mute my phone so it's not distracting our class. Up. 
Okay. So here we arrive at an equilibrium. And what the equilibrium means, quite simply, is that at that point, our interest rate is where supply and demand decide. Now we're going to look at some factors that may shift the supply curve over and therefore change the interest rate or shift the demand curve over in either direction and also shift the interest rate. Right? We're also going to look at some particulars where both move and the interest rate, <coughs> excuse me, the interest rate may stay the same, right? But everything else might change. So we'll look at we'll look at those different scenarios and we'll kind of try to understand why each of them happen. Right? But the core dependency to understand is exactly what I just went over, right? Which is that very high interest, companies don't want to borrow money. But consumers want to lend money. At very low interest, companies want to borrow money, but consumers don't want to lend it. And so the tendency is for consumers to move in this direction and for the bond market to move in the opposite direction, reaching an equilibrium. Now, we're going to talk about two, two basic ideas here, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the graph up so that we can evaluate what actually happens. And we're going to list the ideas on the top one at a time and think about what the effect will be of those particular transactions, right? So imagine if liquidity of the bonds rises. So you're able to buy and sell bonds very easily. You're able to transact very quickly. You don't have to wait a very long time. There's a very active bond market, right? What that does is it takes the entire demand curve and it shifts it to the right. And this is pretty important because what ends up happening is that since more people are interested in buying this debt and buying these bonds, they end up farther along the curve. And when they're farther along the curve, the interest rate actually declines, right? So the interest owed goes from about here to about here, right? So to put that in perspective, the price might go from something like uh, 1,950, so something like 850 to 875. And what that means is that the debt is more expensive to buy up front, and therefore you'll earn a lower interest because more people are involved in buying the debt. Now, the profitability. Paradoxically does the same thing. So if you look at a bond, right, and perhaps it's good to consider profitability per unit of risk, right? So it shifts the demand curve to the right, again, but what ends up happening is that the actual interest rate ends up de declining, right? So you're taking less risk for the same amount of money, essentially, right? That's what the expectation is. And if people believe that profitability will be rising, right? And this is one of the things we'll discuss in a, in a different lecture, is when people believe that stock prices, or stock prices and bond prices are based on expectations. That's probably the best way to put it. They're based on expectations. So if the expectation is that profitability will increase, the demand curve will shift to the right because more people will be entering the market, more people will be selling their capital in exchange for these bonds. Right? The same thing happens if inflation is expected to rise. Right? So if inflation is increasing, right? Actually, excuse me, it's not going to be the demand that shifts to the right. It's actually going to be the supply that shifts over to the right. So if we expect inflation to go up, right, let me erase these arrows here. If we expect inflation to go up, then the supply curve shifts over to the right. And what that does is it makes the interest rate higher, which is exactly what we expect, right? The interest rate is higher and prices are lower, right? That's the combined thing. There's a greater supply of bonds because what are companies trying to do? companies are expecting that in the future inflation will be higher. And so if you borrow money in the future, that will include the inflation rate, right? So for example, if you could borrow money at 3% today, but you expect that inflation will be 2%, if nothing else changes, 
your total debt in the future might cost you 5% to borrow. Right? So you're going to want to borrow as soon as possible in order to avoid that. Right? And so the supply of bonds increases drastically. And at the same time, if consumers expect inflation to increase, they don't want to buy bonds. Right? And the reason they don't want to buy bonds is because they can get a better price for them in the future. Right? So the demand curve shifts to the left. And here we have an interesting scenario right? where our supply, our quantity of bonds has actually stayed the same. But the interest rate has risen. So just with the expectation of inflation, we've influenced the interest rate. And this is very important, right? Because it's going to be a tool for bodies like the Federal Reserve to use in order to influence bond prices, right? Which is why consumer confidence in financial markets tends to be so important and so looked upon. So that's inflation. The next thing is government deficit. Now it's important to remember that it's not only companies that are borrowing money from financial markets, right? This is why, uh, I don't remember exactly which president it was, but when he left office, or it was an, uh, an advisor, excuse me, it was an advisor, and what he said, I, uh, I can't make you rich, but you can make yourself rich if you know more. Um, <laughs> government deficit The bond market is king when it comes to decisions, right? Because the bond market lends to the government. When the government issues debt, they borrow from the bond markets, right? Investors snap up that debt. And usually that debt is considered not, it is life, yes, of course. Um, it is life. So I, I always do my lectures live because I like to interact with the chat and have a conversation about what's going on. So the bond market is king. And the reason the bond market is king is because the government deficit is financed by these bonds. So when the government is running a deficit, what ends up happening is that your supply curve shifts to the right because the government has to borrow more money. Right? The demand curve in recent times has been unchanged. Right? There are some exceptions, but for the most part, the demand curve stays the same. And so when the government runs a deficit, what it does is it increases the interest rate paid. Right? When that interest rate goes up, people are more likely to go out and borrow. Right? And this is a great way of counteracting the government borrowing too much. Because the financial markets are unwilling to lend to the government, the government is unable to run a deficit. Because it needs to pay that deficit right away. How do I do the maths? I, um, I have actually quite a few lectures on math, but I also have a guest speaker coming in, or a guest lecturer, I guess, who is a, he's a, a math major and a programmer, and he does all kinds of cool statistics stuff. Um, so I'd love to have him come in and kind of do a few lectures, right? And so these are the overall effects of what's going to be happening to our interest rates. Right. And so there's a few interesting scenarios that end up coming up regularly. Right. So, so far, what we've considered is if you see in the news that interest rates are rising, you can think about why is that happening? Is it because of inflation? Right. Is it because governments are borrowing too much? Right. What is the reason why interest rates are rising? And if they're declining and the opposite is happening, you can do the same. Right. You can discover why that is. So the Fisher effect is something that we've already covered, right? And this is a popularized effect. But essentially, when expected inflation rates rise, the supply of bonds rises. The demand for bonds declines across the board. And so you're produced with the same exact amount of bonds on the market, just at a higher interest, right? And this is called the Fisher effect. In an expansion, 
the supply of bonds shifts to the right. And so does the demand for bonds. And what you often get, depending on which one is pulling harder, right? So if we're in an expansion, right? And the supply of bonds shifts faster than the demand, we'd have rising interest rates. If the demand is shifting faster than supply, we'd have dropping interest rates. But either way, we are getting an increase in the supply of available bonds. Right? And this supply is having a great deal of effect. And then finally, what I'd like to look at is the following. So I often get questions about, well, you know, the government printing money and, and inflation and all of those kinds of things because people tend to be genuinely concerned when their government is running a large deficit. Right? And so we have the following curve. This is the demand for money. Right? Now the demand for money doesn't really change across the board, but this is the money supply. So if you had to borrow money at 33%, you probably wouldn't demand very much money. If you could borrow money at 0%, you'd probably demand as much as you can, right? As a matter of fact, this probably trends to infinity at that point, right? So the money supply is the amount of money in the economy. And so you can think about the following things, right? If incomes are increasing, which they are now in the United States, then the money supply will shift to the right. As the money supply shifts to the right, interest rates should increase to keep up. If they don't, we get inflation, right? The second thing is the price level, right? So we have income causes a shift to the right of the money supply. We have the price level, therefore inflation, right? Which is what we just discussed. So if inflation is happening and the price level is increasing, and what I mean by price level here is the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, right? So it's this basket of different things, washing machines, bread, Chinese food, whatever they decide to put in there, and they check it year after year to see how much it's changing, right? And so if the money supply increases because the price level is increasing, then the interest rate should also rise. Now, if both of these things are happening, what you could get is hyperinflation, right? And you could see how that could happen very quickly. People want to be compensated because the price level is rising. So they get higher wages. They spend those wages on rising price levels. Because there's more money in the economy, price levels keep rising. Full sale uni. I don't actually know what a full sale uni is. Um, yeah, I don't know what a full sale uni is. Also, that math problem doesn't look that bad, uh, but I definitely can't do it on the board because I, I have no idea what 60 to the 50th power is. Um, but these are the incomes and the price levels, right? And they're based on CPI, and when the money supply changes, everything else changes as well. And then finally, The direct money supply shift, right? So if the money supply just straight up does shift, right? It just the amount of money in the economy is increased by some other measure, right? Whether it be quantitative easing, whether it be buying bonds, whether it be the government issuing very large deficits or tax cuts, for example, right? If the money supply shifts, then the interest rates should also rise, right? And these are kind of expected outcomes. And so, the incredibly powerful thing about this tool here is that you know you can use it to solve problems if you're in school and you're taking an economics class, right? But it's a very simple mental model. So if you sit here and you commit this model to memory, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to see some news and understand how that might impact the economy. So, for example, let's say you want to borrow money to buy a house, and suddenly you hear that inflation is expected to go up, right? Or you believe, based on other things you see, that there might be a lot of inflation. 
So it might be a good idea to borrow now rather than borrow later, right? So this is the kind of thing, the mental model that you leverage, and you leverage this to make better decisions. Now we'll be going over all kinds of examples for what kind of these decisions are, right, and what these decisions might mean to you. But the reality is, if you're able to think about this in a supply and demand scenario, and you're able to think about your work in a supply and demand scenario, you're able to do that. Okay, let me see if there are any questions. Full Sail University in Orlando. I don't know anything about Full Sail University. Sorry, real, real strawman. Um, I don't I don't know anything about the university, but I would look at um, I would just look at university reviews University reviews and ranking So you might want to do that um, You might want to look at or you might want to reach out to some alumni So if you get on like LinkedIn or Facebook, you might be able to see who graduated from there and speak to them And then finally you have to consider it in context Right, so if you're trying to be an engineer in, uh, let's say you're trying to do financial engineering, it might be a very good school for financial engineering and very bad for other things, right? If you're trying to get a degree in, in liberal arts, it might be a great school for liberal arts. Um, if your goal is to go to college and party the whole time, it might be great for that. Um, I can certainly tell you that it's very sunny in Miami, uh, but that's about as good as my, my help will be in this case. So. Oh, you want to go to a film school. Okay, cool, yeah. Um, actually, if you've ever heard of Alpaca Patrol on YouTube or on Twitch or on Twitter, um, he is going to be much better for answering that question uh, about, about film school because he actually went to film school. Uh, but to be completely honest, my, my domain is basically as far away from film as possible besides putting this on the internet live. So, having said that, I'd like to thank you for tuning in. Uh, this has been Money and Banking, Behavior of Interest Rates. I'm still learning how to navigate this board back and forth. But if you haven't followed the stream, if you haven't followed me on Twitter, if you're not following me on YouTube, I do post all the lectures on there once they're finished, but I like to do them live so that we have chat interaction. Uh, thank you very much and make sure you follow and that's it. Have a wonderful day.